praise God. You may be seated. I want to welcome you to Resurrection Sunday. Amen. We're celebrating a Savior who has risen. He is no longer dead. He is not in the tomb, but he is a risen Savior. Hallelujah, hallelujah. And we're also having today Remembrance Sunday. We are remembering where we came to the crossroad of making that decision. My way, God's way. Which way will I choose? That makes all the difference, the choice at that crossroad. The crossword is a phrase that is used for describing a point in your life when you have to make an important decision, like, am I going to go to college, or I'm, am I going to backpack across to Europe? It's a decision we make. It's a choice. But it affects all the other things of our life. When we, make, we come to those points and we make that decision, and spiritually, every one of us come to a personal crossroad. We're alone in that time of our life. When we come to that crossroad of choosing, we're, we're alone. It's me and him. What choice will I make? It's hard for us to forget that first spiritual crossroad, the time we felt our need for God, but struggled with giving control of our life over to Him. We're faced with that decision. A choice must be made to either continue in our way or change our life course and choose His way. For some of us, it's been many years since we came to that initial crossroad. And for others, you've just started out. And that's all good and great. But we can all rejoice together today because we're taking another look at that crossroad decision. And we are celebrating the choice that we made. And we're remembering how it changed our lives. So let me give you a few things that you could celebrate. The power of the cross. The resurrection power that Jesus, that raised Jesus and it raised us to, us to new life. We have a glorious hope because of the blood of Jesus over our lives. We are covered by his blood. We have the power of the Holy Ghost within us. And we have a promise of eternal life through the power and the resurrection of Jesus. And that's why Easter is so important. Because if Jesus had never risen, we would never have the power of the Holy Ghost as an option in our lives. That made all the difference. A risen Savior. Hallelujah, hallelujah. So we are going to hear some testimonies this morning of lives that were changed, and we're going to remember and celebrate those transformations that came at the crossroad. Let me give you a challenge. If you have ever wondered if you're influencing on those around you, if you're reaching out to those that are around you has been worthwhile, I encourage you to listen to these testimonies today and listen for those references to how people affected the choices at the crossroad. We have those influence on us all the time. They're from outward, they're from inward. We have friends who influence us for good or for bad. But we're going to hear today about the good influence that caused a good decision at the crossroad. You see, sometimes God allows those things to come into our life to influence us because he's always reaching for us and he's wooing us and he wants us to make a decision for him for our benefit, not for him, for him, but for us too, mostly him. So um, we're going to look at the choices that happened at the crossroad. And I, if I could encourage you just to celebrate with those who give testimonies, we're going to sing, we're going to celebrate, we're going to worship, we're going to hear testimonies. I invite you to join in and just celebrate with us on this Resurrection Sunday. Amen. Hi, my name is Sue Robitas. Um, this is a short testimony, but it talks about how someone really did help me out when they reached out to me. I was young, probably um, around 20, and um, this is exactly how I felt. I said, is this all there is? Is this it? Is this all there is to life? As a young woman, I desired the life that I had seen in television shows and movies. I wanted all the excitement, all the purpose those heroines had in their life. I was always looking for other ways to fill the God hole that was in my heart. But I didn't even know there was such a thing as a God hole. 
Imagine my disappointment when I went away to college and I found out it wasn't like a Mickey Rooney movie. <sighs> so I didn't find what I wanted in college, so at the end of the school year, I came home and I moved in with some of my softball teammates. I got a job at the American Optical. We called it the AO. Dennis would call it the hey-ho. Enter Jane Stanhope. Now, Jane was married to my cousin, Sonny. They were quite a bit older than me, so I didn't know them personally. I just knew them through family legend or family gossip, some of which was pretty rough. But Jane had become a born-again Christian, right? She was spirit-filled, and she attended the Full Gospel Center in Southbridge, and everybody knew it. So Jane was a soul winner. She was a fisherwoman on a mission for God. And I had gotten that job at the AO. Well, amazingly, Jane just happened to get hired at the AO too. And in my department. And she even worked on my team. Go figure. Sometimes God does stuff like that. I, woman among strangers, looking for a tribe or a team or a family to belong to, and Jane opened her life to me. She treated me like I belonged with her. She spent time with me. We talked about God things, about the Bible and the Holy Spirit and how he moves in our lives. That hunger for something more in me was lit again, and I became a believer. I guess I was caught, right? She fished me. I got and I guess I became a disciple because I've been here for more than 20 years. Actually, more than 40 years. So it was a long time. Okay, it was nice to have someone like Jane who had skin on that I could share my Christian walk with. Somebody who encouraged me when I was struggling. Someone who would say, it's going to be okay. God's got this. And Jane shared how God had moved in her life. And you know what? Her life wasn't perfect. She'd had a hard life, and she was scarred by it, but she was also victorious. She held on to God right to the end, and she was an example to those around her, especially to me. What I would say to those of us who are wanting to be fishers of men or disciple makers, don't wait to be perfect. You'll never do it if you wait for that because you know what? You're never going to be perfect. None of us are. Don't wait until you have all the answers. You never will. None of us ever do. Get filled up with the light of God and let that light shine. Be a beacon in this dark world. There are hungry souls all around you, some in your family, some in other people's families, and God wants them all. If we open our lives to them, they're going to see past us to the light giver, and we will become fishers of men and disciple makers. Let's just do it. I'm going to read from Luke uh, chapter 24. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women had taken spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they entered, they did not find the body of Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He's not here. He's risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee. The Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. Then they remembered his words. When they came back from the tomb, he, they told all these things to the eleven and all the others. It was Mary Magdalene, 
<clears throat> Joanna, Mary, the mother of James, and the others with them who told this to the apostles. But they did not believe the women because their words seemed like nonsense. Peter, however, got up and ran to the tomb. Bending over, he saw the strips of linen lying by themselves, and he went away, wondering to himself what had happened. While they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. He said to them, Why are you troubled, and why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones, as you see I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they were still did not believe it because of joy and amazement, he asked them, do you have anything to eat? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish. And he took it and he ate it in their presence. He said to them, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, this is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third days. And repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in His name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. I'm going to send you what my Father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. Amen. I'm Jaden, uh, as you all know. Um, back then, I was I was a real mess. Um, I was really bad at listening to people. I was always getting in trouble, like with my mom, with the law, and stuff like that, for the things I did. And I always, always got what I wanted when I wanted and when I asked for it. Um, and I thought like my life was perfect. I thought I had everything basically. Um, but what I didn't know was how much I was going to change in a couple of years. I started coming to youth group with Nathan, which is like by far the best person in the world. <laughs> um, I started coming to youth group with Nathan in 2017. And it wasn't until the youth camp of 2019 where I got the Holy Spirit. And I remember that day like it was like it was yesterday. Like it was the third day. I was on my knees at the altar. I was crying with Nathan. And like that was that was the point where God said to me, like, this is enough. Like there's 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 no turning back from this. You either choose me or you don't. I was filled with the Holy Spirit. And I and I knew that something had to change. I could either continue the way I've been living or I can choose to be led by the Holy Spirit. I chose to change, of course, but as people ask me, why did you change? You had everything, like, you, you, you was getting what you wanted. So why become a spirit-filled Christian from being a sinner like I was before? And I told them, like, I don't know, it was, to me, like at that moment when I was crying on my knees, it was just that powerful. God was just, he really touched me at camp. And it was, like it's indescribable really because I was just crying and I was just like, why am I crying? Like this power is just, it's just so much. So I chose to walk away, think, walk away from things that I've been doing. I've smoked, I've done a lot of things, I've been listening to bad music, um, 
just a lot of things that have been that I've been going that that I have been doing that really wasn't Christian, I guess. And I chose to share with every uh, I chose to share what I have with my school because I like I have it and it's just like I I want other people to know what it's like to be I I wanted other people to know what it's like to have Jesus in their life. So I chose to bring my Bible to school. I read it at lunch every day. I I brought it I brought it to school. I walked around with it. I set it on my desk out in the open so people, and I did this so people could ask, hey, what is that? Why do you have that? And, then, and I would explain to them, like, this is Jesus. Um, so then I started to, I wanted to start a P7 club that fall, which is basically a Bible club for school. For school. Um, and ever since then, it's just, being with God has been, it's been hard, like, it's been unridiculously, it's been ridiculously hard, like, you, <laughs> but it, in the end, it's, I just know it's all, always worth it. Hello, um, my name is Giordani. I was born in Puerto Rico, and when I was born, the enemy wanted me dead, because I was born two months early, because I had the cord wrapped around my neck, and I couldn't breathe. And my mom was losing too much blood. And then the doctor said to us, only one of us can survive. But God performed a miracle, and we both survived. We moved to Southbridge when I was five years old. And my mom gave her heart to God, but my dad didn't. At age five, I had a fractured leg, and my dad and my parents did not know why. And it was very rare for me to have a fractured leg. And my dad gave a heart to God, and I can still walk to this day. Even though God had already done these miracles in my life, I still wasn't living for him. Both my parents gave her heart to God, but at age five, at age 10, I started smoking, drinking, and going to parties. When I was 15, I slept over at my friend Jaden's house. He invited me to go to church with him. So I came at this church and I felt welcome here, and I know God, God wanted me to be here. Since then, my life has been different. I come to youth group, I go to church every week, and I feel like God is moving me and changing me to a different person. My name is Dakota. Um, there are some people who grow up in church with their families. A few might pick up a Bible and read a random verse and realize God is the only way to true happiness, love, and mercy. Then there are a small portion of people who are blessed with friends who mentor you and bring you closer to Jesus. That was me. When I moved to Southbridge, I was not in any way, shape, or form involved in church or interested in God. But after a couple of months, I started attending Sunday school here at the church with my neighbors. I'll be honest, I only started going and continued to go because of the snacks, games, amazing teachers, and because my friends were doing it. I remember for a while, I didn't understand why the other kids would pray or read their Bible in class. This is because I never took any of the lessons I was hearing to heart. My friend Jaden went to church camp in 2019 and received the Holy Spirit and started sincerely and genuinely living for God. He then started sharing the gospel to the people around him, myself included. I realized that something needed to change. I saw the change in him, and I wanted that for myself. I knew that I had to decide if I wanted to keep living the way I was living or live my life for God. So I started changing my habits. I began to dress more modestly, and on August 2nd, 2020, I was baptized in Jesus' name. I chose and am still choosing to live a life pleasing to God instead of a life pleasing to the world. 
Jaden and I both made the decision to seriously live for God and have become better people than we used to be. I'm grateful he came into my life because he is the reason I know God's grace today. I thank God every day for giving me the most amazing people in my life and for opening my eyes to the truth of his love, grace, and mercy. So I was about 26 years old, and uh, I was not living for God. And like Jaden said, I had everything in the world that you could ever want. And uh, as life had gone on, uh, there were some things that I was missing, though. There was one thing that I was missing, and that was a relationship with my father. And my father was in California, and I happened to be in Worcester. And I got a phone call that said my father was in the hospital, and he was basically in a coma, about to die. So at that moment, I said, you know, I grew up in church enough to know that I can pray. But the Lord had moved on my heart and told me to go to California. So I went to California, and I, I knelt by his bed, and everybody was ready for him to just pass away. But I prayed, and I said what most of us have said and what many people have said, Lord, if you hear my prayer right now, if you save my father, if you cause him to live another day, Lord, I will live for you. I'll give my life to you. I'll tell everybody about you. You know, the problem with a lot of young people is that, you know, the world tells you to go to school so you can go make a lot of money. And people tell you that you should do this and do that, but they don't tell you about purpose. And people don't lack money, they lack purpose. And so a lot of times what happens is because you're lacking purpose, you fill your life with all of these things that are just, they're vacuous, they're, they're vain, they're, you know, you want to look a certain way. Let me tell you something, looks fade. My wife still loves me, but I don't look like I used to, and it's all right. But I thank and praise God at that time I was in California, and I'm praying and asking the Lord to save my father. I had a cousin that was a model, and she was dating a record executive. And she said, if, you know, he, basically they said, if you want to come out here, just come out here. And I was meeting people. And the next morning, my father woke up out of his coma. So hallelujah. But like Giordani said, I didn't want to live for God. And in that trip, I started meeting people, and I started realizing that I could really come out here and make a life for this. And in a moment, God showed me my life. He said, this is what you're going to become. And I saw what I was going to become. I saw the end of it. It was not what I wanted. It was what was going to happen. I saw the end of it right in the flash of a moment. I. And I got off a plane. I got on a plane. The next plane I could get out, I said, Lord, I don't want that. And I came home, and I went to a job. On that job, I met a man. Met many people, but I met this man, and I knew that I should start to talk about the Lord. I started to pray. I started to fast. I started to seek the face of God. And uh, after, a, I think it was about a 40-day fast, and I'm not bragging. I'm just, it was the Lord that did that. And it was, um, I fasted uh, uh, one meal a day. I didn't, I went, I didn't go 40 days without food. Just, it was one meal a day. I met a man, and I witnessed him about Jesus. The Lord had moved in my life so mightily, I just wanted to share that with him. And every Easter, oh, I don't know if you can hear this. Can you hear that? Happy Easter, my friend. Happy Resurrection Sunday. And um, I just love hearing that voice. I um, Actually, I kept your voicemail from last year, and I've listened to it, I don't know how many times over the past year, and um, it's just been... Uh, Pretty soothing for me. It's always a pleasure, Johnny. I love you, man. And um, I just pray for a blessing over your family. Just to have your protection around you and your, and your family. And um, I look forward to uh, every single day. That man was an alcoholic. Like my father was an alcoholic. <laughs> And I asked that, Lord, I asked that my father, I asked my father in heaven to bless this man. And what I got in return was a ministry of reconciliation. I got a way to tell people about God so that they can come back to God. They can be reconciled unto their father. And in that trip, I was reconciled to my father. He lived another 15 years after that. And I was able to find purpose. I was able to find purpose. I was at a crossroads, and I could have went down another path. And God put before me life and death. 
And the life that I chose gave other people life as well because that man lives for God now. He hasn't missed a year. He hasn't missed an Easter. He hasn't missed one year to say, and he is risen. He calls me every year to tell me thank you. The purpose that God has given me is not just mine. It's everyone that would take up the mantle to serve him. But I give God glory for who he is. Hallelujah. The year was 1977. I was 10 years old. Several of my older siblings were leaving the Catholic Church, which my dad was bringing us to, and attending a new Pentecostal house church in Quinnebog, Connecticut. By this age, I was enrolled in catechism after school. We learned the doctrines of the Catholic Church, and I was given a set of rosary beads. I wasn't sure what to do with them, so I just hung them on a nail on the wall. My older brother, John, was the first one in our family of 15 children to be converted and receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost and be water baptized in Jesus' name. The pastor of this newly formed house church, Terry Hart, had witnessed to my brother and taught him the gospel as found in the New Testament book of Acts. My brother began to share his experience with the rest of our siblings. He showed us several scripture passages which spoke of repentance, water baptism in the name of Jesus, and receiving the promised gift of the Holy Ghost. When I saw this in the Bible at 10 years old, I wanted it for myself. The thought of having a relationship with Jesus living in my heart was an amazing thought. I felt God's love drawing me at that time. Two of my brothers and I asked my dad if we could attend the Pentecostal church and be baptized. His answer was an emphatic no. He didn't know anything about that church and he didn't want to hear any more about it. We didn't know what to do. My brother John told us to pray about it. We didn't know how to pray either. But in a simple way, we asked God to make a way for us to go. We were 9, 10, 11 years old. That same night after supper, my dad changed his mind. Actually, my heavenly father changed my biological father's mind and told us that we would have to choose for ourselves. We could go. So on October 9th, 1977, my two brothers and I went and were water baptized in freezing cold water in a metal tank as Pastor Hart stood waist deep in the water. But before I was baptized, we listened to a sermon by the preacher. At the altar call, I went up and kneeled down and began to repent. As I was praying, my speech began to stutter. I wasn't sure what was happening, and I stopped praying to ask my sister Susan, who was kneeling beside me praying, what was happening. She said, that's stammering lips. Keep praying from your heart. You're receiving the Holy Ghost. I continued to pray, and as I did, I began speaking in other tongues as I was being filled with the Holy Ghost. I remember sitting in the rocking chair the very next day and singing a song that I made up with the words, I am one day old. I am so thankful for the people that Jesus used in my life as a boy and ever since to nurture me in the most important relationship one could ever have knowing Jesus and being known by him. I want to preface this song with a little explanation. This song came out of an experience that we shared with my dad, who now has Alzheimer's and will be going into a nursing home very soon. God gave him a vision of heaven The Bible gives us that hope one day. This is, this is not all there is. This life is not all there is. It's very short part of our life. We will have an eternity that we will spend somewhere. And 1 Thessalonians tells us, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not even as others which have no hope. 
For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Oh, hallelujah. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up to meet him in the air and we will forever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. These words that we're going to be caught up. We're going to be caught up to meet him and we will forever, ever, ever be with him. Caught a glimpse of home where I belong. Caught a glimpse
God. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Just to hear you say, well done. Well done. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. You're my blessed hope, oh, God. Hallelujah. Would you stand? Just a minute. Lift your hands and thank him for all the good things he's done. Let's, let's embrace everything that's been said here. Let's celebrate just for a second. God, thank you for the lives you've changed. Thank you, Lord, for what your blood has done. Thank you for the grace and the mercy that you've shown. Thank you for the things that you've done in each of our lives, Jesus. We give you glory. We give you honor and praise. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Great celebration. Thank you, praise team, for leading us in that. All the great testimonies. On August 20th of 2018, Yahoo News says there's a 46-year-old British woman who was on a cruise ship, the Norwegian Star. She fell overboard. As soon as a woman fell to the ground below, the crew notified the Coast Guard and a search rescue operation began. Her name was Kay Longstaff. And ABC News said that she was seen falling overboard at 11.30 p.m. And that was Friday night. Saturday, rescue guard, the Coast Guard showed up or found her at 9.45 a.m. She is a flight attendant. She used her training and emergency, her emergency training and her knowledge of things to float. She kept her head and she floated all night long. That must have been a long night. Sometimes we just need to float. We just need to lay down on water that we're not supposed to be able to survive in and breathe in deep and relax until help comes. There's people in this room today who might feel like they're sinking. You might feel like you've fallen overboard. You might feel like your life is over as you know it. Sometimes uh, that needs to happen to us. Sometimes we need to give up, lay down, our lives, and wait for Jesus. I wonder if you just pray for everyone in this room, or maybe those who will be watching this, that if somebody's out there, they've gone overboard, their life is like we heard today, their life is gone or shot, or they're, they're swimming, if they could just have the courage and the grace to float until Jesus can pull them out of the water. Would you pray for someone right now? God, we pray for everyone in this room. Pray for everyone who will watch this. We pray for our friends and our family and our loved ones. Everyone who's struggling, everyone who knows that they need you, that you would help them to believe today, to be able to relax in your love and to trust your grace. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. I want to go back through the scriptures that were already read here today. And I, I, I just want to point out a few things you may have never noticed. I didn't really notice until God put them on my mind. Very early on Sunday morning, the women went to the tomb, taking the spices they prepared, and they found the stone had been rolled away from the entrance. Mark says that they were, one, they were on their way to the tomb, wondering who would move that big stone for them. When they got there, it was already moved. Uh, have you ever gone into a circumstance, you felt like God was with you, but you didn't really know what you were going to do when you got to whatever you were going to? That's what was happening to them. So they went in and didn't find the body of the Lord Jesus. This was probably not quite as devastating as watching Jesus die on the cross. But this was the first Easter, and this was a devastating weekend for God's people. This was... This was yet another dig that the enemy could give them. You know, we are sometimes hard on the disciples. Peter cursed. He said, I never knew him. All the disciples left. They fled. They, they forsook Jesus and fled. But keep in mind that several things were happening here. There was a physical thing that was happening. Jesus was being killed. 
and buried. That was huge. But there was what I've been talking about for weeks now. There was an unseen world that was at work. And at that point, Friday and Saturday, the devil thought he was winning. And evil spirits were going stark raving mad. And they were coming at Peter. And they were coming at the women. And they were coming at the disciples. And they were just rattling their cage. And those human beings, those, those disciples and the women who followed Jesus... They, they were not perfect, as was said today. They, they messed up. They cursed. They ran. They were scared. And if you have lately been pushed, stretched, and maybe even felt like you failed God, let me remind you, there's always grace. There's always, all of us go through those periods of time. If you've been attacked spiritually, sometimes the enemy will put you down for a little while. The key is, don't let him drown you. Float. Your flesh feels like you took a wrong path. The disciples and the women came to the tomb. They saw it empty, and they stood there puzzled. Anybody been puzzled lately about your life or about how things have gone? God, how come you let that happen? How come you didn't let that happen? Or... uh, Sometimes when we get puzzled, when, when our life changes too much, we can not only freak out, but we can start freaking out about the things that really don't matter all that much. I'll give you an example. I've mentioned to you that my, my, my stepmother, uh, she's in an assisted living situation and her funds are running out, so we've been trying to figure out what to do. And what they're recommending is that actually she's, she went into assisted living out of the hospital. Now she's doing a little bit better. So they're recommending that we move her to uh, independent living So she doesn't have to pay so much every month. So she's moving from an apartment into a bigger apartment that's on in the same complex. It's it's just like a great thing, you know. It's like wow, this is an answer to prayer. And uh, she just I've talked to her two or three times in the last couple days because she's worried about who's going to move the boxes and uh, all the little things that don't really even matter. She says, "I've got so much stuff I need to give away." And I said, "You're moving to a bigger place." You know, it might be good to give things away, but you really don't have to give anything away. But change, it's just, she went in during COVID, she didn't see anybody, she didn't see family members for nine months, and everything was just topsy-turvy, and she, she doesn't, you know, her routines are messed up, and she lost her home, and, and when our lives are messed up like that, we can freak out, and the enemy will come in like a flood, and he'll try to take advantage of that. Sometimes we'll feel like Jeremiah. I've referenced this many times because I relate to it. Jeremiah chapter 20 says, Oh Lord, you misled me. And I allowed myself to be misled. You're stronger than I am and you overpowered me. Now I'm mocked every day. Everyone laughs at me. What happened is God called Jeremiah into the ministry and Jeremiah said, gung-ho, let's do this thing. And then it didn't go like Jeremiah thought it would go. And Jeremiah said, you tricked me into this, God. Can anybody relate to that? You go to the altar and you say, God, I give you all. This is going to be great. Let's go do this thing. And you do this thing and it doesn't turn out the way you thought. You had it in your mind that it was going to go. And you find yourself saying, you tricked me. And if if you're not careful, the spirit of the enemy will come and try to get you to be offended at God and change your mind about doing things his way like we heard about so many doing. If we have expectations and they don't turn out that way, the only thing that can save us is floating, trusting, letting God take care of things. They stood there puzzled. And two men suddenly appeared to them, clothed in those dazzling clothes. And the women were terrified. Everyone say terrified. Terrified. They were terrified. Now, uh, the tomb was empty. They're puzzled because they thought Jesus was going to live forever, and then he dies. And now they're ready for him to die, and now he's not there. Just nothing makes any sense. It's all messed up. But all of us can look at what Jesus told them. Jesus told them this would happen, right? Now, sometimes we can't hear things. I was talking to somebody the other day who, I, I, I pastored 
I pastored here for 25 years, and they were here at the beginning of my ministry. And they were telling me about something God had revealed to them. Like it was a brand new thing. And I'm thinking, I preached that to you 15 years ago, and you weren't hearing me. Well, that's not because they were a bad person. Sometimes we just can't, if you're not ready to understand that, I could talk to a first grader about quantum physics and they wouldn't, they wouldn't get it because they, they need some other things to happen in their life before they're ready to grab onto that. And, and this is what's happening in these people's lives. They're terrified. They're, they're, they don't really understand this. They're experiencing one of the most amazing stories that's going to be celebrated for thousands of years to come. And they're terrified. Some of you might be lately saying, oh God, help America, and oh God, help us, and we're in the middle of this worldwide pandemic, this pandemic, and this is the most horrible thing that's ever happened in my lifetime. And God's up there saying, this is the greatest thing I've done in the last century. I'm going to do a great revival, and I have to prepare the world for this. And, and we're terrified. We're in the same situation that Jesus' disciples and those women were in in those days. It's Easter Sunday. And we're terrified. He told us that there'd be political unrest in the last day, didn't he? He told us in the last day there would be pestilence, there would be earthquakes, there'd be wars and rumors of wars. Didn't he tell us that? He told us that people would lose their minds, they would call good evil and evil good. He told us that people would be all whacked out. He told us also that there would be a powerful church and a great harvest and many souls would be brought into the kingdom. And we stand here at the doorway puzzled. How are you going to do this? This isn't turning out the way I thought. I didn't didn't understand it was going to be this way. Uh, They saw two men in dazzling robes. That was a supernatural thing. But it didn't make sense with the last couple of days and everything. It didn't make sense with the body being missing. They they weren't able to quite catch it. How How do you believe in the supernatural when some of your greatest dreams have just been dashed? You just lost your job. Somebody just left your, you know, you had a separation of some kind. It's right then, just like we heard in the testimonies, we come to these crossroads again and again where you have to choose all over again. I have to choose. I'm going to trust him today like the first day I trusted him. They were terrified. They bowed their faces to the ground. And then the men asked, or the angels, why are you looking among the dead For someone who's alive. That's a good question, isn't it? They were looking in a graveyard for someone who was already alive. And and that's what I want to talk to you for just a minute about. Because I find myself sometimes focused on all the negativity in my life that I can get my brain around. And I'm looking for answers I'm trying to figure it out. How's life going to work? And how's this going to work? And, and God, I thought you said this. And why not this? And, why, and, and, and God wants me to lift my eyes above the circumstances and above the dead, above the graveyard, and look to the promises he's given me. If those ladies right then would have thought about, oh, he said he would rise from the dead. He's probably walking around somewhere. He's probably somewhere. Let's go look in the garden somewhere. Let's go look somewhere beyond the grave because he's probably out there somewhere. They just didn't think to do that. And I don't think you and I would have thought to do that either. The women were terrified. And I want to ask you the question today. Why are you looking at the temporal for someone who's eternal? How often do we try to make God fix this world instead of lifting our eyes from this world to His world? Why are you looking for carnal solutions to your spiritual problems? The message says, why are you looking for a living one in the cemetery? It's real simple and I'm not going to be long today. I just, I just want to challenge somebody here today. Whatever you've been focused on right now, if it's been getting you down and you've been bogged down and how is this going to work and why, why did God not do this and what about this and what about this and, and you start wondering and worrying, just 
relax, lean back and float. He's going to come take care of everything. He's going to take us where we need to go. Scripture said, went on to say, the disciples heard the angels, excuse me, the ladies heard the, the angels say, he isn't here, he's risen from the dead. Remember that he told you. Son of man must be betrayed into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and that he rise again on the third day. And they remembered that he'd said this. So they rushed back to the, from the tomb to tell the 11 disciples and everyone else what had happened. Sometimes you have to be reminded of the promises. Thankfully, God is patient with us. And their brains were having a hard time. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, several other women who told the apostles what had happened. They got vulnerable. They, they, they started to wrap their minds around it that Jesus had risen from the dead. And they went and said Jesus had risen from the dead. But the story sounded like nonsense. Would you say nonsense? nonsense. It sounded like nonsense. If you and I would read it in the message paraphrase, it would say the apostles didn't believe a word of it, thought they were making it all up. I'm telling you this, when you and I get in the spirit, when you and I are speaking faith, people who don't know of spiritual things are going to think you're making it up. They're going to think you you found this place in la-la land somewhere, and maybe you've lost your mind. Can I get a witness? That's the reaction. That's the reaction of Jesus' assistants who'd been with him for three years and saw him do everything. They thought it was nonsense. You and I have seen God do so much. But still today, isn't it kind of hard to believe him for today's issues? Yeah. He sold your house four years ago, but you don't know if he can sell your house today. He gave you a job 30 years ago and 12 years ago and five years ago, but you don't know if you, he could, you know, your finances are tougher right now and it's harder right now and you can't get your mind around it and so you panic and you worry and you fear and, and the preacher gets up and says, believe God and it sounds like nonsense to you. And you think I'm making it up. However... Peter took a chance. He jumped up, ran to the tomb, stooping in. He peered, saw an empty linen, and, and, and then he went home again, and you know the rest of the story. Here's what I want to say this morning. I think you have four choices, four mindsets that you can live by. I'm going to start with the worst and move to the best. You could have the mindset. You can just be completely carnal, and you can think that creation in the Bible is all a bunch of myth mythology. It's just a bunch of made-up stuff. And you can join the academics and the cynics, and you can rely just on human understanding. And those who go this route are so arrogant because they think that nothing can be true unless they understand it, and they have to define everything, and they have to figure everything out. And I've been there sometimes, too. If I think God has to make sense to me, then I just made me God, and he has to do what I think. I don't want to live there. The second mindset that I could live by is I could be super spiritual. I could just spiritualize everything. I could, I could think of spiritual things to explain everything so I don't have to face reality. Oh, God's going to take care of that, and I don't have to worry about that, and I'll just pray about that. And the Lord told me not to pay my bills, and, and you know, all, all we spiritualize everything. My boss hates me because he expects me to be there at 8 o'clock every morning. And, you know, I, I have prayer to do. And, you know, he gets mad when I show up at 9.30 and tell him I was praying. Spiritualize everything. That's no good. We could live in this dimension where we believe in God. And we believe in the supernatural. And we believe the Bible. But we're always trying to figure it out, and we're always frustrated with God because it, it, we just can't figure it out. This is where I think a lot of us live sometimes. I believe He's all-powerful, but this just isn't making sense right now. So I'm a little frustrated with God because He's not doing things the way that, you know, we talked about this. 
We had a staff meeting, and he's doing nothing like we talked about in the staff meeting. There's a better way, and that's this final one. Embrace the eternal, the immortal, the invisible, and remind our brain that God lives in this dimension that I don't understand. I can't even see what's happening right now. There's so many good things happening in the spirit realm right now, and, and you, wouldn't know it, you wouldn't know it from the news, and you wouldn't know it from what's happening in the political world. You wouldn't know it even from what you're feeling right now sometimes. But we can take comfort. We can just lean back and float and say, I don't know how long I'm going to be in this water, but he's a coast guard that never fails. He, he's going to come. He's going to take care of me. And I'm going to stop looking for the living among the dead. Don't look for God to try to to be logical like you are. Don't expect Him to come fix things the way you think that they ought to be fixed. Don't even really focus too much. I mean, we have to live our lives, but this world is not our home. We're just passing through, and these things don't mean as much as you might think they mean. The disciples were grappling with unjust courts, with bigoted rulers with disappointing events, with a a seeming reality that their dreams were being crushed, that their ministries were being pulled out from under them. Everything was crashing, but just the opposite was true. Jesus had just done his grand finale. Jesus had just conquered death and hell and the world. Jesus had just done this amazing thing, but the spirit world was in chaos and it wasn't logical and, and, and everyday people didn't get what was going on. I'm telling you, we're in a similar place today. And you have to very intentionally, everyone say very intentionally, believe the truth Believe his promises over what you feel and what you see and what you even logically think. On the other side of Easter, they had a stronger faith. On the other side of Easter, they saw multitudes come to salvation. But that weekend of Easter, we celebrate it, but that weekend of Easter was one of confusion and one of puzzlement and one of terrified people. Don't let carnal thinking and doubt and fear keep you frustrated and confused. Remember Jesus one time told the disciples, lift up your eyes and look into the hills. Or, or, look, look into the fields, rather, for they're white unto harvest. Jesus was saying, you know, here I am preaching and everybody's giving me a hard time and they're trying to shut me down, but I, I'm not even paying attention to everything that the Pharisees and Sadducees and the rulers are doing. I'm looking at the field. There's a lot of people out there. Right now, you, you may say, we got COVID, we got this, we got that. Lift up your eyes. God said he's going to do an awesome thing in these last days. He's going to do what we just heard. More testimonies like we heard today. Hundreds of people coming in, people influencing one another. But sometimes we just have to float. If you feel like you're drowning, float. If you feel like you're drowning, float. Would you read that? If you feel like you're drowning, float and believe that God can save you. Would you stand with me? You and I have quoted the scripture often, Philippians 4 and 8. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, Whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. And what do we think on? We're worrying over our finance and we're budgeting and rebudgeting. And I'm not saying you shouldn't budget. I'm just saying if you're so focused on how is this going to work, how is this going to work, and, and you haven't really let faith flow in your heart, and you haven't allowed the promises to flow in your heart, and you haven't allowed things to rise up in you and, and make you see that God is doing things, I'm going to help you with that right now. We're going to close this celebration with more celebration. God is doing good things. For example, brother and sister Bisquette, Although, you know, they're elders, they're, they're actually the age of elders, and they just both had COVID, and uh, Brother Bisquette had pneumonia, 
And, you know, it's one of those situations that they're in the age group and there's pneumonia and this could really take them out. But God brought them both through. Neither one of them had to go into the hospital. The only reason they're not here today is because they have to now quarantine so they don't get anybody else sick. Good thing, God is still healing. God is still taking care of people in all this. Brother Ray Duran is going to be baptized this week. Isn't that awesome? Good things are happening. My wife and I led the prayer group in Plainfield this week. It was kind of uh, brother and sister farmer from Cranston, Rhode Island are wanting to do prayer groups, so they wanted to see one in action, and since the Busquets were sick, my wife and I went to Plainfield, and we led the prayer group. And we did a prayer group on prevailing prayer. We talked about how sometimes you just pray and pray like, like I'm talking here. You're, you're on your back. You're, you're floating. You don't see how it's going to get done, but you just keep praying and praying and praying. And I challenged everybody to pray for a good, solid five minutes. I don't know if you've ever tried this, but I asked them to pray for one thing for five minutes. When that happens, it's the first few times, it's really hard to fill up that five minutes. Well, Brandy and Greg Hapgood were kind enough to let us, to host us. Now, because of COVID and all uh, changes in leadership and everything that's happened, it's just worked out that they haven't hosted prayer group for a year. So we showed up and we had a good prayer group and uh, we enjoyed seeing them again. It seemed very good. Uh, I, I thought, you know, I felt good about the prayer. And when I got home, I got a text from, from Greg Hapgood. He said, I meant to tell you last night, but didn't get the opportunity. During our five-minute prevailing prayer, I received the Holy Ghost. He said, as I prayed hard and attempted to say the words that came to mind, I find myself mumbling and unable to form the words. I felt so light as if I was floating. I tried to reset my words, but I just couldn't. It was an amazing feeling. Thank you so much. Now, we started having prayer group probably 15 or 10 years ago at their house, and he wouldn't even come to prayer group. But little by little, he, he started sitting in the other room, and then he came to prayer group, and then he got baptized. And, and I, I couldn't do it. I can think through it. I can try to figure it out. I can try to understand. I can try to move him. But if we just keep living for God, if we just keep prevailing in prayer, if we, get, if we just keep walking the walk, he's going to show up, and he's going to do what only God can do. So let's be intentional. Let's practice what the disciples did on that first Easter. They had to say, I'm puzzled, but something miraculous is here, and I'm going to have to choose to believe the nonsense that Jesus rose from the dead, or I can just wander around the cemetery wondering where, what they did with his body. God has given us some promises, and I'd like to read two of them in closing, just to, just to help you lift up your eyes. He said to us, in October of 2020, I will be exalted upon the earth and I will be exalted in the heavens and my name will be lifted up and I will be glorified, glorified in front of all people and you will see my hand. You will see my work that I will do upon the earth. Heaven is coming down. Everyone say that. Heaven is coming down. Does it feel like it? Do you see it? Does that logically does heaven seem to be coming down your situation? Well, if you don't see it, if you don't feel it, if it doesn't make sense, ignore all that. Jesus said, heaven is coming down. I'm coming down upon this earth to reap the harvest that I prepared for myself. For my kingdom is coming and I will do manifest works, glorious works wondrous works among you, my people and across the whole earth. My glory will cover this earth and I will reap a great bountiful harvest. I tell you today, follow after me, follow closely after me. Don't get ahead of me. Don't lag behind, but walk right with me into this harvest that we will reap together that I have prepared. Give me glory now. Give me glory now as you are able. Give me glory now and follow after me. Follow after me. For I am doing what you will see. Well, when people hear that word, it's a little nonsensical. Jesus, have you been watching the news? 
Don't you see what China's doing? Don't you see the problem we're having with Russia now? Don't you see what's happening? They're, they're trying to put acts through Congress that shut down churches. Don't, don't you see all that happening? Yeah, I see all that. Just like I saw the Romans and I saw the cross and I saw all the powerful people that put me on the cross. But I was in charge of all that. I was still running the whole show. Everyone was puzzled because... It was in my realm that these good things were happening. And God gives us grace if we'll let Him. He, he gives us glimpses into that world so we can be aware of the world we have to be in down here, but we can also be aware of the victorious things that are happening in His world. That's what prophecy is. Prophecy isn't a foretelling of the future so you can make good plans. Figure it out. Be ahead of everybody else. Prophecy is him saying, hey, it looks like they just killed me, but I laid down my life. It looks like they were in charge of me, but I was saving the world. It looks like I went down to death to stay there like everybody else, but I went down to death to get the keys of hell, and I came back from death. He told the leadership in January of this year, my people, I come to you, I speak to you for I am glad. I'm so glad that you have committed yourself to me again. We will do a great work. Notice that we, we will do a mighty work. You will see so many around you turning to me for they're hungry, they're thirsty, they're hurting, they're in pain. And I have come that they might have life and that much more abundantly. Oh, my people, you are truly my friends if you come to me and work with me. We will do a great work. We will do a mighty work. We will do a quick work. It will be glorious, and you will sit with me in heaven. We will sit. We will party together, you and I. We will rejoice over how many have been saved, how many have been washed and delivered from the hideous things that will happen here. Oh, my people, I love you. I love you. I'm with you. I'll empower you. I'll give you courage when you need courage. I'll give you strength when you need strength. Just stay close to me. Stay entwined with me. Walk in my spirit. I'll walk with you. You'll walk with me. We'll get this thing done. It will be glorious, my people. So here we stand on Easter. In the grave doorway. Looking puzzled. He just said all these awesome things. I don't know. I've just been through the crucifixion. Uh, my, my, raw, my nerves are raw. Uh, my, my brain is fried. And he, he's wanting me to believe he's not here. The, these guys in dazzling garments are wanting me to believe he's risen. Like he said. I've heard for years that we're going to have a great revival. Where's that great revival? I'm standing, you know, it looks like the world is getting worse, not better. How in the world are we going to have a great revival when the world is getting worse? Float. Float. Lean back and trust a God who is well able to do exceeding abundantly above all we ask or think. So as the worship team leads us in one more celebration song, let me just challenge you in this last song. To very intentionally don't worry about the bills that can't be paid don't worry about whatever you were attacked with this week whatever feelings came on you whatever heaviness or weariness or fear or whatever came at you that that's gonna happen that doesn't mean anything all that means is you're alive and the enemy's trying to take you out but God is still gonna do everything he said he's gonna do and you're still in good hands and and the, the Coast Guard is coming it may take longer than you'd want it to take it may be that you'll have to lay back in the water longer than you wanted to be but God is going to come if you just not panic if this woman Longstaff would have panicked she would have drowned herself the only reason she could float all night is because she kept her composure. She trusted someone was coming. She made herself relax. She made herself not panic. How big is your God? Is he big enough that you can trust him to take care of this too? Is he big enough to do a great revival in a world that hates him, supposedly? Is he big enough to do a great revival when Hollywood 
is making fun of Christians when, when politicians are trying to shut down true faith. Is he big enough? Yes, he's big enough. And if, I don't know how. I don't understand it all. But my spirit can rise up in me and say, it's going to be okay. He's going to take care of it all. And I'm going to celebrate him right now. Would you sing this song together? Oh, I'm so thankful we have a God we can trust. He's never going to change. He's always going to be trustworthy, a sure foundation that we can build upon. Thank you so much for sharing Resurrection Sunday with us. And we hope your afternoon and your week is lovely. God bless you. Thank you for coming.